Number 16, looking at some different test statistics and just stating whether they will cause us to reject the null hypothesis or not reject the null hypothesis. And here's the whole thought process behind this. If our null hypothesis is true, then most samples, most sample means are going to be close to that null hypothesis, which will produce test statistics that are close to zero. So if we get a test statistic that is really far away from zero, if it's really far into the tail of the distribution on either side, far away from zero, then there's one of two conclusions. Either we just have a very unusual sample or our null hypothesis is not true. And out of those two options, we're always going to go with the option that our null hypothesis is not true. We're going to reject the null hypothesis if our uh, test statistic is far out in the tails of the distribution. It's not close to zero. And this is just because we always trust that we're gathering a good random sample. So we're never going to assume that we get an unusual sample that's not representing uh, the population well. So we trust our data. We trust our sample. And so that's why we will reject the null hypothesis. And we could be wrong. We could be making an error if we got unlucky and just did get an unusual sample. And that's when type 1 and type 2 errors will come into play. So number 16, looking at some test statistics and seeing if they are far enough into the tail for us to reject the null hypothesis. And determining if they're far enough into the tail is always based on our significance level. And here we have it marked. Uh, where the cutoff is for being far enough into the tail to reject the null. And um, it's a two-tailed test, so either further to the left than this critical value or further to the right than this critical value. And so negative 2.302 would be further to the left, further into the tail, so we would reject the null hypothesis. 2.221 would be in between these critical values. It's not for far enough into the tail for us to reject our null hypothesis. So for that one, we would fail to reject. And then with the next two, 2.346, 2.3 is far enough into the right-hand tail uh, that we would reject the null. And negative 2.352 is, again, past our critical value into the tail. So again, we would reject the null. So number 17, we're running a hypothesis test here. Our claim is that our population mean is less than this value, strictly less than. That's going to be our alternative hypothesis. Now we need the statement of equality in our null hypothesis, and so it will be the greater than or equal to the complement of our alternative. Now in 7.3, what we're learning about here is when we're uh, testing, doing hypothesis tests for population means, but we do not know the population standard deviation. And when that's the case, we're going to be using the t distribution instead of the normal distribution. So notice here, nowhere do they say what the population standard deviation is. So we'll know from that that we have to use the t distribution. We are told the sample mean and the sample standard deviation along with the sample size. And we'll need all three of those as we use the t-distribution and calculate uh, the t-test statistic. And so uh, in the book here, we can see the formula we're going to need for the t-test statistic. Taking that sample mean, subtract our null hypothesis for the population mean. That's the top part of the fraction. And on bottom, taking that sample standard deviation and divide by the square root of the sample size. And so plugging in the values from this particular problem, our sample mean minus our null hypothesis for what the population mean is. That's the top part of our fraction. And so the bottom part of the fraction, then the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And that gives us then our standardized test statistic in the t distribution. To find the p value of that, we're going to use the t.dist equals t.dist. 
enter in that value for our test statistic. And with the T distribution, you have to list the degrees of freedom, which is always one less than the sample size. So we had a sample of size 52. So our second input here would be uh, 51. And then our third input, comma, true, you always want to list true um, in this formula here. And this gives us the calculation for our p-value, the probability of getting a sample like the one we did, or even further away into the tail of the distribution. And so then to conclude the hypothesis test using the p-value approach, you always compare that p-value to alpha. If it's less than our alpha, we would reject the null hypothesis. But since it's larger, 0.59 is quite a bit larger than 0.02, and so we will then fail to reject our null hypothesis. It means we do not have enough evidence at our significance level to support the alternative hypothesis, which in this case uh, was the claim. And number 18, running a hypothesis test, a used car dealer says that the mean price of a three-year-old SUV is $20,000. And so is an exact value equal to an exact price? Recall this helpful chart we can use. Is equal to an exact number will give us a null hypothesis with a equal sign in it to that value. And our alternative would be the complement then not equal to that value. So that's how we would set up our null and our alternative hypothesis. And then to run the test, we'll notice that nowhere are we told the population standard deviation. So to run this hypothesis test uh, for our population mean, we're going to have to use the T distribution because we do not know the population standard deviation. We have the sample standard deviation and we have the sample mean. And we're going to use those to calculate our T test statistic. And so using that formula here, uh, we're going to plug in those values to get our t-test statistic. In the formula, the top part of the fraction will be our sample mean minus our null hypothesis value here for the population mean. And on the bottom of the fraction, our sample standard deviation divided by the square root of our sample size. Our t-test statistic here. And in this problem, we're actually not using the p-value approach. If we did, we would have to use this formula, t.dist.2t, because this is a two-tailed test, because we have a not equal to hypothesis. And so you'd put in your test statistic, your degrees of freedom, one less than the sample size. And we get our p-value 0.056. And that's just barely larger than our alpha. So in this case, we would we're, we're going to not reject the null hypothesis because our p-value is larger than alpha. But we're going to actually look at this test. We're going to get the same exact results, but we're going to do a different approach, which, to, which is to look at critical values uh, and rejection regions. This is just like what we did in number 16, seeing if our test statistic is far enough into the tail past our critical values in the tail in the rejection region causing us to reject our null hypothesis. The critical values which mark the start of the rejection region are all determined uh, based on our alpha which in this case is 0.05. To find those critical values we can use this formula in Excel dot 2t because we have a two-tailed test. Enter our significance level and then our degrees of freedom one less than the sample size and we get this for our critical values. And like number 16 now, we have those numbers that are marking the cutoff spots for where our rejection region begins. If our test statistic is further into the tails than those critical values, we will reject the null hypothesis. Excel just gives us one number back. Uh, we use the symmetry of the distribution. We know the other critical value is that same uh, numerals, just with the negative in front. And so now uh, the rejection region is being less than that negative value into the left-hand tail or greater than that uh, positive value even further into the right-hand tail. And we, now we want to see if our test statistic is in that rejection region. And 2.01 is not 
past 2.06, so it's not quite into the rejection region, and so we're going to fail to reject our null hypothesis. It's not in the rejection region. And so at the 5% level of significance, there's not enough evidence to reject our null hypothesis, which was our claim about the mean price of the SUVs. And number 19, a credit card company is claiming that the mean credit card debt is greater than a certain value. Greater than a certain value uh, has no equal sign in it, so it's a statement about our alternative hypothesis. So our null then would be less than or equal to that value. So that's how we're going to set up our null and our alternative hypothesis. In our problem here, we have no mention of the population standard deviation, so we know we're going to have to use the t-distribution to run this hypothesis test about our population mean here. And we have our sample standard deviation, our sample mean. We're going to plug those in to find our t-test statistic using this formula here. So the top part of the calculation is our sample mean minus our null hypothesis value for the population mean. And on the bottom of the fraction, we have the sample standard deviation divided by square root of the sample size. That gives us our t-test statistic. And in this problem, we're uh, doing the critical value approach. And that's completely based off of what our alpha is here. That's how we're going to find our critical values for our rejection region. This is a one-tailed test, so we just want t for the t-distribution dot i and v. Enter what our alpha is, and then the degrees of freedom, one less than your sample size. And Excel always gives back the left-hand critical value. So this is marking 5% left-hand tail of the distribution. And by the symmetry of the t-distribution, we know that the right-hand uh, critical value for um, there being 5% of the distribution in the right-hand tail would be those same numbers but positive. And we know we're doing a right-hand tail test because our alternative hypothesis is greater than. It's pointing to the right. Um, the, that symbol is pointing to the right is how you can remember that. And so we, this would be our critical value. And just to recap what we're doing with the rejection region. Uh, we have our critical value marking uh, the rejection region. And if our test statistic is even further into the tail past that critical value, it's in the rejection region. And so we would then end up rejecting the null hypothesis. And so right hand tail test, anything greater than our critical value is what we're going to reject. Our test statistic is larger than that. So we are going to reject our null hypothesis. It, this value is in the rejection region. So what we can say is at the 5% level of significance, there is enough evidence uh, to reject the null hypothesis, support the alternative hypothesis, which the alternative hypothesis was our claim here, that the credit card debt is actually greater than uh, 5,000. That was our claim. And to conclude, I just want to show how the p-value approach gives the same result. In Excel, we would use this formula, t.dist, enter our test statistic. The second input would be our degrees of freedom, one less than the sample size. And then our third input is true. And remember, Excel is always going to give the probability of being further into the left-hand tail. This is a right-tailed test. And so we need to do one minus that answer in order to get the probability of being at that value or further to the right. And so this would be the probability of getting a sample like the one we did or even further into the right-hand tail. That is less than what alpha was. And so once again, we're going to reach that same conclusion and end up rejecting our null hypothesis.